Well, thank you all for coming. I'm Kevin Jaffe, the department chair, and I'd like to welcome you all to our final uh, talk in our 50th anniversary alumni speaker series. Uh, to get started here, we openly have our main speaker, John Crawford. But to start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Kirby Turner from the, see if I get it right, the Jenkins, Wilson, Taylor, and Hunt yeah, law right. firm, who have graciously uh, agreed to sponsor uh, the, the series. And Kirby would like to say a few words. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, like Kevin said, my firm is very excited about help being a part of this uh, successful speaker series. Uh, as a patent attorney that has helped uh, UNC's uh, computer science department attain intellectual property protection uh, for all of their, for most of their innovations, um, and then they and themselves being a learning experience, I can, st I can tell you after looking at Mr. Crawford's very uh, impressive bio that today will be no different. Thank you again for coming, and thank you, Mr. Crawford, for taking the time to speak with us. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Fred Brooks, who will introduce our speaker. It's a great pleasure to introduce to John Crawford. Most computer architects consider themselves fortunate if they get a shot at two machines or three machines. And John has done more. His preparation for that included undergraduate school at Brown, a master's degree here, which we finished in 77? 77, yes. 77. And then he went to work for Intel, and part of his preparation for being a computer architect is five years as a software engineer, and that's superb preparation for becoming a computer architect. And so he, he was called on then to develop the 32-bit architecture, the 386 for Intel, then the 486, then the Pentium, and the Itunium, which was joint between Intel and Hewlett Packard. And so he was faced with the problem of taking what had started as an 8-bit product line <laughs> and extending it to 32 and then to 64-bit. And designing within the constraints of an existing product line when you're doing something radically different is a major challenge. And the fact that he did it well enough at each step that they wanted him to do the next step <laughs> is a big So it's a pleasure to have John Crawford. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, addressing uh, the group as part of the 50th anniversary. So thanks for, uh, for inviting me to come out. And I would like to begin my talk with a, uh, I'm going to actually bookend the talk with something that happened to me last year, which was my last award, where I was named a fellow of the Computer History Museum out in Mountain View, California. Uh, if you've never, if you have a chance uh, in a, a free afternoon or something while you're out in, in Silicon Valley, I highly recommend going there. Anyway, uh, the, as part of that award, they did a video interview of me. So it's, it, on, uh, it's online, it goes on and on for hours. If you can't get to sleep at night, you could uh, give that a try. But, but as part of the award ceremony, they extracted a five, four or five minute video from that. And uh, the first part they chose to extract actually has quite applicability to uh, Carolina. So I thought I'd start with that. So my interaction with with Fred Brooks was, uh, was, uh, was one of the reasons I went there. One of the best things I did, uh, best experiences I had at North Carolina, was taking a computer architecture class from him. And one of the, the things about that, uh, you know, he, I, he walked us through some of the basics, but then each of us had to pick a computer and do a term paper, if you will. And I said, this Intel 8080, this is, uh, you know, this is an interesting thing. So I, I did my project on the, uh, on the Intel 8080 and did my term report and, and so on. And uh, Brooks was not impressed with my paper. <laughs> he wrote some comments on it. I think I got a B on the, on the, on the report to be in the class. But off the bat, you can tell my interest was in uh, 
had already had sparked an interest in this microprocessor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to start with a little humility, I guess. So, so this is not a technical talk. I'll, I'll touch on one or two technical topics uh, along the way, but, but more from uh, what I learned rather than, than any really big details. So I'm going to go with a little more depth of my resume and then dig into some anomalies, curious things that happened in my 36 years at Intel, and close up with some things I found that worked for me to, to keep work and life in balance in what was a pretty intense working environment. So let me get, uh, get on with this. So the last uh, 14 years or so I was at Intel, I, uh, I guess I was too old to head up a project. So I uh, headed up some investigations in some key topics for servers. So I ended up with uh, reliability and power efficiency investigations and, and, and uh, came up with some things that were incorporated in our server product line. Um, Going back to the beginning then, uh, I was a software engineer for five years. Got my uh, ink was just dry on my master's in computer science from Chapel Hill. And I went out to Intel and did programming tools for the 8086 processor, things like uh, assemblers, uh, linker, uh, uh, conversion tool. Curiously, the 8086 was not binary compatible with its predecessors. Instead, in Intel thought, the right way to get this compatibility was through a, a, a transliteration tool. So they had this wonderful thing, Conv86, would take 8080 assembly code, assembly code, and transliterate it into 8086 assembly code. Uh, the last project I did was a, Pascal, a code generator for a Pascal compiler for the 8086, and as part of that, um, I dug in very deeply to the. <laughs> every bit in the instruction set. So this is fabulous training uh, for, the, for the next thing that I was, was going to do. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, then through a, a rather fortuitous turn of events, I ended up being the chief architect of Intel's 386 chip. I'll go into more depth of this in the anomalies, because this is certainly uh, an, an anomaly. Uh, and, and then in good Silicon Valley fashion, before you get done with one processor, you had to be already working on the next one. So there was a year, year or two overlap between the, uh, the 3D6 before we were completely done with it. We had to be in the early stages of architecting the, the next generation, which the, the challenge and the, and the opportunity was the, the Moore's Law, the, the, the guys in the, the, that built the transistors and managed the uh, integrated circuit manufacturing said, congratulations, the next uh, two years from now, you'll have twice as many transistors. What are you going to do with them? <laughs> and uh, so we had the opportunity then to figure out the best use for those transistors and uh, uh, work through the design process. And uh, again, an overlap as we got the 46 out the door was to get started on the 586, which uh, of course became the Pentium processor as the intellectual property rights would not uh, allow us to trademark a number. Uh, we tried, but uh, in a, a couple of different ways, but we couldn't trademark a number, so they came up with this goofy name called Pentium. Uh, somebody pointed out to me that's a, a merger of a Greek and Latin kind of stuff, but anyway, it worked. <laughs> uh, and uh, it worked up through that. Afterwards, I had a couple of years where we were looking at a 64-bit extension of our 32-bit extension of our 16-bit extension of an 8-bit product. Uh, we worked on that for a couple of years, and then HP approached us with a radical new instruction set, and Intel decided it was a good idea to, to do a joint project. I ended up managing the joint Intel HP team that refined the Itanium architecture. I, I, I can't say I defined it, but because it was defined really and, and initial development took place at HP Labs over several years, but the team uh, that I managed got it to be something we could build and, and uh, had many generations of the Itanium products that were an enterprise level, uh, highly reliable kind of product. Uh, uh, and that was that. And I already mentioned uh, 
then the, the focus changed from project orientation to more of a technology focus and mentoring the younger folks coming up. So I would spend more and more of my time working with uh, and, and providing advice and guiding uh, the, the folks coming up. So I retired in 2013 and my last day of work was just before my 60th birthday um, and I uh, had a wonderful uh, retirement 60th birthday celebration that my wife organized for me and uh, uh, since then I have changed to uh, uh, some different fields. I'm on board of directors of global media outreach, uh, board of directors and a tech council for that uh, outfit. It's a internet uh, outreach, uh, Christian outreach ministry thing. And I'm also involved with a small liberal arts Christian college in California that's the last couple years been looking at starting a computer science undergrad program. So that's kept me a little bit busy and has used some of the skills that I've, uh, that I've picked up. So that in, is a little more in depth on my resume. Of course, you know, I was here and uh, <coughs> I received a master's degree here. Brown uh, graduated again with a computer science degree. It was the first year that they were able to do that. And uh, Brown is also celebrating a 50th anniversary for their computer science department. I think they started, Andy Van Dam started that in 1965, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it was 64. And I graduated, I grew up in Pennsylvania. So I graduated from Conestoga Senior High School. And here's the uh, diploma to prove it. <laughs> More importantly, here's my senior picture. <laughs> Where has all that hair gone? Okay, so w with that as kind of an extended introduction, I want to focus on or, or go in, in depth on a couple of strange things that happened to me along the way. Some of these I can provide uh, what did I learn from this activity or from this event. Others are just, uh, they just happen. And I think this is one that maybe just happened, but uh, we'll see what's going on. So 20th of April, 1979, okay, I left Carolina in, in the spring of 77. I started August 1st of 77 out at Intel. So I've been there all of 18 months. Uh, and I was project leader for the second release of the 8086 assembler. I was doing all these software tools. And the main thing we were doing was adding the 8087 floating point instruction set, support for that and how one would program that particular thing. And my team was all of uh, two other people, I guess. So this was uh, the activity. And then John Palmer was an industry veteran, and he was one of the leaders for the, the uh, IEEE Standards Committee defining what would become this famous IEEE 754 floating point standard. And um, at the time, I was working on, okay, how do we support this thing? John was uh, defining what it was, working with Professor Kahan at Berkeley and, and others that were, were uh, defining the, uh, the thing. So anyway, I come to work and I find a paper memo in my inbox. Now, this was back in the prehistoric days. So this, this was uh, before email. And the way we would communicate is you would write something and uh, paper, it would get copied by a secretary and distributed to the people that you wanted to distribute it to. And uh, so I get this memo and then uh, and I pencil a reply. We'll see that later. So here's the memo. So this was, uh, I don't know how many of these kind of things I saw. He had a nice letterhead. It's to me from John Palmer. Uh, and he's got a counter proposal. So I, I started to read it. And you can, I don't know if you can, how far back you can see this, but it's a very oddly worded <laughs> thing. I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the second sentence is, it, it is at best a chameleon approach and at worst an almost useless kludge. So, uh, and, and, uh, and the final thing, which actually makes some sense, he says it's a very poor example of compromising integrity and quality for a small schedule improvement. Where have I heard that before? So anyway, that was, uh, that was well and good, but I think what first caught my eye was the list of people he was sending it to. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it, this is how you would do. You, know, you would write something to someone, and you would copy folks that you thought really should, should be in on the conversation, or at least be aware that what was going on. So what did he do? He copied 
I'm sure you recognize a couple of names up here, Gordon Moore, Robert Noyce, Bill David Dow, Al Michaels, Terry Optendike, Kapil Nanda, Jack McDonald. That was my whole management chain, up, all the way up to the, to the, to the top. <laughs> And then, he, for good luck, he threw in an executive vice president, a couple of marketing folks that were senior, you know, senior vice presidents. So I, I, here, I, 18 months in the in the job, and uh, <laughs> you know, what you know, what is what on earth? Is, so my, you know, my stomach, my heart fell, and and, and uh, but then I, after a few minutes, I figured, no, wait a minute. Looked at the text again. I don't think he sent it to these people. I think he's just pulling my chain. So then I got mad. <laughs> and here's where it's, you know, it's, I was really lucky that email was not available to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat down and said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pen a, a response. And, and the subject is going to be memo etiquette, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, that, so I would write this up and, and hand it to a, a secretary who would type it up and with a list of folks and everything like that. Now, for some reason, he left Andy Grove off the original list. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe unbeknownst to me, Grove was on a sabbatical or something. But I thought, OK, I'll throw him in, too. Uh, uh, but before I, so before I got to send this, you know, and couldn't hit the send button on email, I went and talked to my boss about it. And he said, John, come on and talk. I'm all steamed up. And, you won't believe what Palmer did. So he sat me down, we talked through it, he calmed me down, he, he took the, uh, <laughs> the memo from me. He said, I'll handle this. And he did. We both calmed down. We, uh, John and I, uh, John Palmer and I, managed to work together and, uh, uh, <laughs> and carry on. But uh, I thought this was, this was pretty odd. So uh, I never did talk to John about this to, to resolve it, but uh, I did keep the, the papers. I'm not sure what I learned about this, but I guess what I, one thing I learned is even very senior people can do some strange things and, and uh, line up and be very enthusiastic about making this change. And by doing so, I was able to override a very strong no way, uh, no how from my boss. And glad that I did. I think it was a, a, a key part of the success that would help to continue on and be, uh, be more competitive. So that was the, uh, uh, th we're not done with the 3D6 yet. I, I really like this project, as you, maybe you could tell. So I come into work one day, and on my chair I find this, which I, I thought was, was fab fabulous. You know, bad cooking can at least be thrown away, but bad architecture is more, much harder to dispose of. I never did find the culprit, but I, you know, I thought this was good advice. Uh, and I actually used it later on. Uh, about 10 years later, I used the same, the same uh, graphic on something. So speaking of anomalies, <laughs> uh, 1984 I got married. Uh, we're right in the middle of the, of the 3D6 uh, activity here. So 1984 I got married and uh, then a, a, yet another anomaly in the next year. August of 85 a large box is delivered to my office. It's from the Paris sales office. Wow, I never got anything from a sales office, let alone a big box from Paris. This is awesome. So what's inside? Open it up. It's a case of Veuve Clicquot champagne. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> uh, so a very nice letter then included from the Paris sales office, uh, basically thanking the engineering team for developing the chip and getting it to market. And good, good advice, right? Don't share it with marketing. They'll just drink it all. <laughs> and uh, so this is fabulous. This was. Uh, a very nice thank you. It's probably the only positive thing I ever got from a sales office. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine they deal with customers day in, day out, and they hear complaints and, and, and whatnot, and they condense all those complaints. And then they, when we come visit, they explode all those condensed complaints at us. So, so this was very nice to get uh, a very positive thing from them. So uh, 86, my son was born, and, uh, and then uh, uh, this nice picture in Hawaii. And, and then in, in 1987, I became a Christian uh, and had worked, uh, had a number of folks working on me uh, over a few years and uh, uh, 
became a Christian in 1987. So this whole period, starting in 1982, when I took this job of the, of the 3D6 activity, up through 87, when we were pretty much done with the 3D6, was a very intense period in my life. You can see an awful lot of things, got an awful lot of things going on. So, uh, well, we finally got done with the, th finally got the 3D6 done. It was fabulous. December 87, uh, if, uh, the, the, if you think back in history, this is when the risk versus CISC debate was raging. And, you know, all the press was filled with, and, and uh, people were, were convinced that these stinky old CISC chips were dinosaurs and they're going to die a well-deserved death at, at any moment. Uh, before this, Intel Microsoft interaction was limited. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the problem was, but, but there was a great friction between Microsoft and Intel while we were developing the 3D6, and we, we, had, we didn't talk to them. Well, that changed once the 3D6 came out. Whatever, whatever happened got resolved, and we were, were, uh, were, were in interaction. And uh, Bill Gates pens a letter to Dave House, uh, Intel VP, I think he was in charge of, one of two people in charge of the, of the microprocessor development team. Uh, division. And uh, I, I never saw this letter until, well obviously I saw it since I have a copy of it, but I didn't see this letter actually until six or seven years later. I didn't even hear about it for two years. But Gates was very unhappy with what was going on with the 46. He had just reopened interactions with Intel and uh, he was kind of frustrated. So I highlighted, I thought I'd, I know you can't see this even in the front of the room, so I thought I'd highlight again some key points. You know, grave concern over handling of its microprocessor architecture. Can't understand why Intel doesn't have anyone smart <laughs> working on this. <laughs> well, you know, this is, this is Bill Gates, I guess, kind of classic stuff. Not one, but two, but three pleases assign one decent architect. Watch over the biggest chip gold mine of all time. So, so this was, uh, I think, and, that, and on the next slide I'll get into what some of the things he asked for. So let me do that. So, uh, you know, he said you would expect Intel to have a significant number of people work on the chip, getting real data to improve it. And that was actually a, a, a task that I had taken on and was, it, well, we, we did something. We were continually trying to learn more and more and gather more statistics and understand how instructions flow through the machine and what was what was going on. So we were, we were working on this. Signif I don't know what he meant by significant number. We certainly could have had more. And it, and it turned out this letter came uh, about the same time that I had a number of meetings with Microsoft. In fact, one, at least one, maybe two, with Gates himself. One of which I stood up in front of him, went through what we were doing with the 46, and he, he, he let me have it. He, he was convinced that there were a couple things that we needed to fix. This was one of them. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't cover, I don't know if he covered this in our meeting face to face, but he, he points out, you know, multiple caches overlapping. By overlapping, I think he meant parallel execution. So executing two instructions uh, flowing through a pipeline, so just one at a time. And that was a fabulous idea, but we didn't have the transistors for it. In fact, that's what we did on the 586, I mean the Pentium. So <laughs> great idea, but we're not quite ready for that. And uh, the other thing was he was really stuck on this, uh, you know, this, again, the risk sys thing. He really wanted us to add delayed jumps to the instruction set, which I, th I thought was really down in the weeds, but that's, uh, you know, that's the way Gates was. He was very, uh, very uh, uh, hands-on, very technical uh, kind of guy. So I didn't see the letter, but I did get the wrath of Gates in a meeting. And in uh, you know, responding to him uh, as best I could, I knew that the delayed jump thing was a, was a non-starter for our instruction set. In fact, I think uh, it got even worse. Uh, a few years later, I think even the risk guys thought, realized it was a bad idea. It was too much of the implementation showing through and, and being visible in the, in the architecture. But be that as it may, it was a hot topic and, uh, and, and so on. So I leave the meeting, and I'm out in the hallway, and my boss runs out. And he said, John, what are we going to do about all this? And I said, well, you know, I know he's wrong about this the jumps, but this data collection, you know that, that piece of equipment I've been pestering you to, to buy for the last <laughs> six months? <laughs> that would really help us. Uh, it, was, it was like a gigantic logic analyzer, something that had you know, millions of uh, 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 vectors that could be captured on it. 
And that would really help us satisfy this and, and give us a leg up working with Microsoft. So amazingly, you know, after six months of delay, you know, next week the PO was out and we were, we were rolling. So what, uh, what did I learn from this? I guess every cloud has a silver lining and, and uh, you know, your critics can be helpful. Uh, they often tell you, uh, they tell you some things, they tell you some things you don't know and you better, better watch out for that, you better consider all that pretty carefully. They tell you some wrong things that you do know, like the delayed jump thing, but then they tell you things that you, know, you already knew, but maybe <laughs> you, know, you can use as uh, uh, you know, to get things that you want to get done. All right, so this is my last anomaly. Uh, summer 1994, there's a floating point divide flaw in the Pentium processor. So who was the design manager of the Pentium processor? <laughs> so who, who was responsible for it not getting fixed beforehand? So it, uh, it turned out it was uh, Intel discovered it in June of 94, but because it only affected some of the lower bits of the results that were returned, we thought, well, well that's unfortunate, but <laughs> at least the sign is right. <laughs> And uh, so we went. We set about coming up with a fix, and we were just going to fix it and roll it out, and you know, ship it along, and probably slide it in a, a, a small little note uh, kind of thing. But in October, uh, this uh, professor nicely uh, discovered it and and uh, approached Intel with it, and I, I don't know what we responded to him with, but anyway, it made it out in the press, and there was a huge outcry. I mean, it was. Uh, a huge outcry. Intel's initial reaction, which is how we had handled this kind of thing in the past, was, oh, it's not a big deal. It, it, it only affects a small number of people. Somehow they came up with a figure of 27,000 years, right? You could, you, you, could, you could use our chip for 27,000 years and not have a problem. I don't know how that came up, but <laughs> and so they were, they were uh, you know, on this and they just stood their ground. And the, the, the Fuhrer just built and built and built. Well, what really broke the, the back of the whole thing, a key point was IBM came out and said, we're not going to ship any more, any more PCs with this flawed Pentium chip. And well, that got our attention. <laughs> but uh, eventually they changed their position and said, well, you know, we'll replace your chip, no questions asked. You just send it to us, we'll send you a replacement. And it was just amazing what happened. I mean, there's articles the next day about Intel's new position. The next day, nothing. The press had moved on to some other controversy and we were blissfully uh, out of the limelight. So a couple things came from that. Intel uh, developed a way of uh, publishing errata. So we, we formalized a way of publishing the problems with our chip. Don't call them bugs, they call them, you know, it's an errata. Uh, and and we, we, we now, we, we, we publish that and, and actually publish it, it's public. Before we would, we would give uh, these chip problems under non-disclosure to only the customers that bought them. And uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, made a, a big change. A and what I learned from this was none of that. The, the reason the flaw was in there in the first place was kind of two things that, that are, well, you know, a couple things that are pretty dangerous. Uh, the, the divide operation is complicated and slow. And programmers do anything to avoid having a divide instruction. They <laughs> anything. They just, you can five or six multiplies, no problem. If we can avoid a, a, a divide, that's great. And it was a performance win. So, uh, well, you know, all kinds of ways of, of multiply by an inverse and make sure you get enough bits to have the right answer and, and all that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, you got something complicated, it's, it's used infrequently, uh, good luck. I mean, you, you've got to be real careful on how you've got to really thoroughly test it. Well, it turned out, that this was not the most complicated instruction that we had on the Pentium chip. We had redone, completely redone the floating point unit from the 486. The, the Pentium chip had a completely redone, much higher performance floating point unit. So new multiplier, we verified that real well. And anytime you ran any, any code, it would <laughs> verify that very nicely. The other thing is we had these transcendental instructions that were defined from the 8087. So the transcendental step kind of instructions that were very complicated. So we knew those were gonna be trouble. We had changed the algorithms even. So we had a very comprehensive validation effort uh, put in place for that. 
divide was kind of stuck in the middle. And frankly, you know, my fault, we didn't give it, if we'd given it one-tenth the effort we'd given the transcendental things, we would have found this problem. So, you know, again, it's the, the things that uh, come d back to bite you are the complicated things that are infrequently used. You can make an argument, well, and then some people solve this problem by not having a divide, <laughs> uh, but having maybe a divide approximation. If we'd taken that step, we'd still be in trouble because the, the flaw was actually in the first step. It was in a table that produced an initial approxima uh, approximation, and then it was an iterative uh, kind of thing, produced two bits of a clock to come up with a divide answer. And uh, well, it turned out the, uh, the other problem that, that came up was premature optimization. The logic engineer responsible for that logic to produce this initial thing looked at it and said, wow, you know, I've got to I got to be careful of the size of this, of this piece of logic. I'll optimize it. So he kind of hand optimized, and he got the positive side right, but the negative side was a little bit off. But he plugged it in, and it seemed to work uh, until Professor Nicely came along, and uh, uh, and, and it, the final irony was when they put the fix in. We, we called back the original logic designer, and he. Time was short. We had to get the, the fix in and get it in production. So he just took the original, uh, kind of the, you know, the textbook formulas for this piece of logic, plugged it in, hit the button on the on the CAD tool, and lo and behold, the logic was even smaller than his optimized version. <laughs> <laughs> now you, you can imagine why, because of course the, the one he'd had there, the optimizer was wrong, and so some symmetries were probably missed. That in the so anyway, uh, you know that was a case where. Premature optimization, again, bit uh, came back to bite us. All right, so I got a few awards. And I mentioned the intellectual property uh, inventor of the year. I thought that was great. A couple PC magazines. And I got a IEEE engineering leadership recognition. So this was for my project leadership of uh, Pentium processor and, and uh, you know, some of the other processors, but which were more technical, but that was more Management and so now there are a couple more I'm really proud of. I got the Eckert Mockley Award, 1995 for computer architecture. So I, uh, you know, I think this is probably my favorite award, as being recognized, uh, uh, recognized for that. 2002, I was named to the Academy, National Academy of Engineering. <coughs> so uh, another great honor. Uh, again for. Design of widely used microprocessors. All right, so I've, I've got one more award uh, to go through at the end, but I want to spend a few minutes on my approach to work-life balance. So there's nothing like a family to give you some work-life work balance. My lovely wife is here with me, and uh, uh, this, is a, this was after uh, I had already slowed down a little bit, but uh, we got our family together in Chicago. We were spread all over the, around the country, and we managed to meet in Chicago. This is the Hobby Lobby store where we managed to get our Christmas picture that year, <laughs> thanks to Hobby Lobby. So what did, what did I do? So I found, uh, early on, I found that combining a couple of my passions, uh, or a couple of phases of my life, aspects of my life in, in together was a real good way of, of giving me some balance and giving me uh, balance. So I mentioned I became a Christian in 1987. And then I would, I would speak at some events. Uh, there are a number of organizations that, uh, you know, Christian, uh, Christian engineering kind of things. This was the Village Gate Group, which was, would meet, uh, I'm not sure if it was once a month or every week, they would have a speaker come in uh, from the local industry, Silicon Valley industry. So I was the speaker that day. And, you know, I would, uh, <laughs> you know, give, uh, give a talk about what was going on at work. So it was kind of an Intel boost a little PR for Intel, and then uh, you know, talk about my Christian faith, and opportunity to share that and, and uh, get a twofer here, if you will, at, the, at these things. The other thing I did was, as our kids were involved in things, my wife and I would sign up in a leadership role. And you know, it's very important, they always need parents uh, <laughs> to step up and, and participate. So here, here I am, uh, this is a Cub Scout, Camp out, and I'm here with my son Alex uh, on a camp out thing. And I was uh, I was going to say den mother. I'm not sure what uh, the man is called in the, 
uh, den leader, I guess, uh, uh, for his Weeblos pack as he was in Cub Scouts. I also was a, a leader and a director and a music director then uh, at our church Awana Club. Again, had a chance to spend time with my kids as they were involved in that activity. I was involved and uh, got to participate. Um, I was a Engineering Week all-star. A couple of times I went out to my kid's school. Here's another chance for a twofer or threefer or something. I, I would go out to the school and, and do an Engineering Week presentation to the kids. The, my favorite activity was, was to be, pretend I was a, a peanut butter and jelly making, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich making robot. And the way that worked was I'd have a jar of peanut butter, a jelly, and a couple slices of bread. Directions I gave the kids were, well, give me a list of, uh, uh, program me. You give me a list of instructions I need to follow to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And it was hilarious. You know, they would, they would start with very general terms, and I would just kind of stand there. Well, I, I can't do that. They would break it down, and it would be, uh, well, anyway, it was hilarious. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I got to do that. I was a judge at the Intel Science and Engineering Fair. They took over this fair while I was at Intel, while I was an Intel fellow, and uh, got to be a judge for a couple of years. And that was amazing to see work. Uh, anyone here participate in the science fair? Yes. Okay. So uh, the, the work that took place there was just, uh, just amazing. Now, one thing that helped me out is Intel, like many big companies, I think, today, recognized uh, uh, employees for participating in the local community. This gives them, you know, some brownie points with the locals and, uh, you know, gets their visibility there. So in 1997, I managed to, to log 170 hours of volunteer time between the Iwana Club, Boy Scouts, uh, Science and Engineering Fair, you know, and so on and so forth. So um, th that, was, that was very helpful and, and gave me a good... Uh, yeah, I guess another motivation for, for doing that. I was a math counts coach for a couple of years. Initially, my son was interested in the math counts thing, and that's how I got aware of it. Unfortunately, he didn't, maybe it's because I signed up to be the, the coach, <laughs> but he, unfortunately, he didn't, uh, he didn't stick with it. But uh, I thought it would be helpful. Here's the team in uh, 2000. I'm on the, on the right and the teacher. Uh, the teacher sponsor was on the left, and there's the middle school kids that were <laughs> on the math counts team. I, I, I said I was an assistant scout master. Got to live aboard the USS Hornet. That's an aircraft carrier moored in uh, San Francisco Bay. So the, the Boy Scouts got to stay there overnight, and I got to go too. And just so my daughter wasn't left out, I was also a Girl Scout leader. Uh, this, was a, this was necessary because I would go with my wife, who was much more involved than I was, but I had to go through a background check and the way that, in order to do more than just drop my daughter off, I had to go, go through a background check. So I was a card-carrying Girl Scout for, for a time, so there you go. So anyway, that is, uh, that's that. So I, I guess overall, work-life balance was um, trying to combine different interests that I had, different facets of my life in, in ways that uh, you know, try to combine together. Probably the most important thing was, was, again, the leadership roles, stepping in and being a parent leader in the kids' activities. And uh, I had some really good quality time with my son, particularly in the Boy Scouts and the Iwana Club. Um, and, uh, you know, that really gave balance that from time to time I would have to work 80-hour weeks. We get these chips come to a crescendo, it's, it's really, everything comes together and it's, it's just crazy. <laughs> but it's very, it, it's, it's crazy, it's intense, it's exhilarating, uh, but it's not something you can do for a very long period of time. So, you, you know, you get through all that. Fortunately, there's, a, there's an end point and then you can, ah, you can relax at least for a, a, a week or two while some other group has got it, got it going. Uh, okay, so now it's time, uh, it's time to wrap up. So uh, let me come back to the last, my last award, I, again, the Computer History Museum Fellow. And I want to close with the words, I opened with the video that opened my, my, uh, 
uh, recognition there. And I want to close with a, just a short phrase that I used to close my talk there. And that is all these chips that I talked about, you know, all these chips I worked on, are obsolete. You know, they're, uh, <laughs> all that work is, is uh, you know, in the dustbin of history. But what remains is my, my family, my wife, my kids, and also my Christian faith. So, thank you. Yeah, so not too tough. <laughs> John, you want to talk about your cufflinks? Oh, my cufflinks. Yeah, I've got to get, get some souvenirs. I got a tie from the 46 project, so you can see it's kind of a chip pattern. And I have Pentium chip cufflinks. I, I wore a French cuff shirt just so I could wear my <laughs> Pentium chip uh, cufflinks. So, a question over here? So, some of my friends work in Intel, and they <coughs> describe the culture as, as pretty challenging. And that first letter that you got. Yeah, well, that was uh, that, that was an anomaly. I mean, that, that the, why I I kept that all these years. <laughs> it was just so odd. Uh, but the culture was such, you know. Again, uh, Intel, like big companies, has a set of values that they drill into their employees, right? And they kind of brand your forehead with them. And, and Intel's key values when I joined the company, they had three key values. It was risk taking, but that had to be balanced with results orientation. So you had to quantify as much as possible the risks you were taking, and then discipline, kind of to, to balance between the two. So it was risk taking, results orientation, and discipline. One of the, one of the attributes, I can't remember which one, included, uh, it was probably results orientation, included this concept of a constructive confrontation. I think that's, that was a, uh, I think might have been the title of one of Andy Grove's books or subtitle. And the idea was if you disagree, if, if you have a, if the, that as things are, are coming up, uh, uh, they encourage an open and honest discussion, get everything out on the table, and if you disagree with somebody, um, you know, make sure you, you have your, your argument correct, you have your data. And, and get everything on the, get everything out, but focus, it, make it constructive. You know, no ad hominem attacks, uh, uh, no name calling, uh, uh, you know, no screaming. Well, not much anyway. Well, I was discouraged anyway. But but uh, but but argue with facts, have an open discussion, and then typically decisions were made in, as a peer plus one kind of thing. So you would be on a group of folks working on something, uh, the peers would present their positions, if you didn't have a consensus from the group, then you'd argue it out and then the, and your plus one would say, okay, we're going to go this way or we're going to go that way. Uh, but the idea being a, uh, well, a confrontation, that's, <laughs> that's part of the culture. But the idea was to keep it constructive and, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I never had a problem with that. I'm kind of a mild-mannered guy, but I managed to hold my own and <laughs> worked out. Yeah, in the middle here. This may sound similar, but I couldn't okay. help keep thinking I was hearing an anomaly in your first highlight, where you said in 1998 you were a fellow, you were managing these projects, and if I remember right, you said, because you were too old to lead a project. <laughs> As a Carolina trained software engineer who's past 40, do I just give up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that, uh, yeah, uh, well, I think it was more a personal statement that, uh, uh, you know, the 80 hour, uh, the 80 hour weeks and the the intent, maybe it's 80 hour days, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, were something that was great. Uh, it, it, this marathon that I ran for 10 years, 10, 11, 12 years, was a fabulous experience. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, turn it back for anything. But, um, you know, I guess I got to the point where, uh, okay, I've been there, I've done that. Let me move on. It wasn't a question of being, Intel didn't think I was too old. I, I self selected and said, uh, you know, what else can I do? And, and uh, you know, is there something else? I, and I got interested in things other than uh, the project kind of focus. In the back. So, um, going back to that letter, <laughs> um, and Bill Gates' letter. Yes. In both cases, claims were made without giving any reasons. Is that common in industry? Ah. <laughs> sure. That was, uh, 
uh, yeah, that, that's uh, interesting. Interesting observation. Um, no. No, that, I mean, that was one reason why the, the Palmer letter in particular was an outlier. Uh, it was just so odd. I don't know what possessed him to do that. But, um, <laughs> the Gates letter, uh, you know, I think you could explain that he had been, uh, he was frustrated and in discussion, I think, with Intel folks and had maybe laid out a, a more complete case with Dave House, who he wrote the letter to, uh, probably on more than one occasion. Oh, and, and to be honest, he did have some specifics in there that he wanted us to do. You know, one of which we did, not in that chip, but the next chip. And uh, you know, the other one he wanted us to do, I wanted to do too. So I, I think he did have some specifics in there that, that really were actionable and, and you know, kind of reasonable. Now he went off off the off the rails in terms of you know, please, please, please get somebody competent working on it. Well, okay, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he wasn't, at first, he wasn't immersed in the Intel values. See, that was. <laughs> but I remember the RISC guys had a very convincing argument. For oh, yeah. Why you were dead. All right, it was done, <laughs> it was over. Uh, uh, this thing has to win. I was personally thoroughly convinced. Sure, yeah. Uh, a lot of people were. Oh, yeah, they're done. A lot of people uh, at Intel were. <laughs> So what, you know, the big, probably the biggest lesson that, that through this whole process was, was when, well, we had this, uh, we had this product line, it's got great success. I mean, it's, it's, it's huge volume, it's the number one uh, programmable uh, you know, general purpose kind of thing out there. We didn't have to be the best uh, in terms of performance. We didn't have to, you know, score the highest on all the, on all the benchmarks. We just, had to, we, we just had to tag along. If we ever got more than 20, 30 percent behind, you know, if we got 30, 40, 50 percent behind, then we were starting, we would start to get real, in real trouble. But we were able to, um, well actually one, along those lines, the risk this thing's going on, we're meeting with Sun to try to sell them the 3D6. Well, we were successful. They, they did have a product line based on it for, for a brief time. And when the questions came from Bill Joy, that I hadn't even thought of. Here we are in the 3D6, but he asked a very insightful question. Looking ahead, and his question was, how long, uh, uh, what does it take for you to determine the length of an instruction? You know, how many bytes do you have to look at, and is it dependent, you know, do you have to do more than one step to determine the length of the instruction? So I, he asked that question, and I, <laughs> I didn't have an answer. I hadn't even thought about it. I don't know what I answered him. But I went back and, and looked really quickly on, on uh, what he meant, because the implications were clear. If it takes you more than one clock to figure out how long an instruction is, you're dead, right? It's gonna, your pipeline uh, uh, and, and parallel execution are just, you know, forget about it. So it was gonna be a huge burden. Fortunately, uh, even with my additional byte for the <laughs> address mode, uh, we were able to look at just the first two bytes of an instruction and figure out how long the instruction is. And that uh, uh, wasn't pretty. And the instruction has the instructions that had you could have modifying prefixes that would throw that all out the window. But they were very infrequently used. So you know, for example, that was that was one item. Uh, the big thing about the wrist chips is they were able to do one instruction per clock. That was their their big thing. They got a pipeline going. The pipeline going on chip cache, uh, the decode, <laughs> fetch, decode, execute, boom, 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 clock by clock. Well, we were able to do that with a 486 for, you know, 99 plus percent of the dynamic mix of the instructions. Uh, well, except for, you know, one clock for instruction. Of course, nobody did one clock branches if they were taken, but everything else was a was a one clock instruction on the 486. So we were able, if you will, to steal some of the big the big ticket items that the risk guys were going after, and we weren't as good as they were. And our you know the instruction set was ugly, but we weren't after a beauty contest. <laughs> so we were able to stay, you know, just uh, as long as we, I think we were like 20, 20, 30 percent behind at the worst, and then eventually we actually, yeah, we actually got faster uh, in the 2000s. The guys in Oregon really kicked, uh, you know, kicked into it and got, yeah, in the back. So it seems a lot of Intel's success was on the fact, right? So it was always like this hot group of architects would run off to the next non-compatible thing. <laughs> 
success was always in hanging around and making the backward compatible next version throughout the company. Every step, you know, there was like, you know, when the, the 432 came along, right. even Itanium to some extent. You right. know, it was a bit of a branch off, but the guys who stayed on the, the true path, I mean, the, the true tried path of backward compatibility were the ones that were going in the end. Right. Which was good, but that also points out the fact I think the undervaluing of the software engineer, the software, right. like carrying that dusty debt forward was where the money was going to be made in the long term, and what was going to sell chips, right. as opposed to who's going to rewrite all that thousands of lines of software to make it run on this 432 yeah. machine. <laughs> right, and, and, and that was, uh, of course, the risk guys would argue, oh, you just recompile for our, our machine and <laughs> you're good to go. But uh, yeah, the value of compatibility was something Intel took a long time <laughs> to learn. And uh, you know, among other things, Andy Grove was trained as a chemist, I think. And uh, at least at one point, he had uh, a conversation with me, he, he, uh, or with someone else, he said, I don't know a good architect from a bad architect. Uh, actually, yeah, he said, I don't know a good architect from a bad architect, but then he said something nice about me. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> That, uh, uh, you know, that something about I was able to stick in there and hang in there and, and carry on through a couple generations of, of product. But I mean, he admitted he didn't know a good architect from a bad architect, and he was leading the company and trying to make, uh, sometimes he was the final arbiter of where re resources would be allocated and what would take place. So Intel managed to have a huge business on a bunch of uh, stopgap products. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, the first couple chips, of course, were, were were, were groundbreaking, but then uh, 8086 was actually a stopgap for the 432, and then the 286 was a stopgap for the 432. The 386 was a stopgap for this uh, other chip, the follow-on to the 432, and you know, on and on. And then, uh, but then uh, after that, uh, the 46, the, the after the 46, I think we consolidated more of the energy into the into that product line, and we got. Uh, both Oregon and Santa Clara teams kind of ping-ponging on, on, on good designs. So why don't we